This podcast may contain explicit language. Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast, the show that uses unique grading style to redefine what the greatest movies are. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. Tonight we apply our patent-pending Stanley rubric to the last movie in our month of Alfred Hitchcock and our Halloween episode, Psycho, starring Anthony Perkins, Janet Lee, Vera Miles, and Martin Balsam. However, quickly before we get to the show, next week we are welcoming a new guest to the show to discuss what might be the ultimate cable movie of all time, The Shawshank Redemption. It might actually be playing on TNT right now, we're not sure. Uh, starring Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman. You won't want to miss that one, so please watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Also, you can now sign up for our weekly newsletter either by the website in the show notes, you can subscribe at the bottom of every page, or you can also email us at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com. Additionally, did you know that our website has the full notes for every episode of the show as well as the master list of movies we've graded so far? There are links in the episode descriptions of every episode to direct you right there. Check them out. And, as always, please like, follow, rate, and review the show on whichever podcast platform you use. With that, Dad, this is our last Hitchcock movie of the year, but this is probably one of the most discussed of his movies. What makes Psycho such a movie of great academic research, study, and discussion? Just the sheer mastery of camera alone make Psycho a brilliant piece of cinematic work. Hitchcock did so much to instill fear and anxiety and suspense and horror all within a small piece of a film which permeated through the other hour and 56 minutes, I think it was, of the film. The shower scene alone could probably have an entire semester class taught about it. Just all the aspects of it, what went into it, how he set it up, the camera angles, the shots, the methods he used. Not, to, not only did it have a significant impact on the psyche of the country when it was released, it had a huge impact on how filmmakers viewed their craft. I guess I can't speak to that entirely, but there is so much layered academic work about this movie. For being what is considered kind of a B genre right now, you know, occasionally we get a horror film that's elevated that occasionally um, will break through. Get Out was kind of that way a couple of years ago, but we very rarely have horror anything from the horror genre that seems to break through as what we would deem quality. This, on the other hand, has always been discussed in that category. And if you remember back to our discussion, I think this was the end of July when we revisited Jaws with our guest at the time, uh, S.A. Bradley of the Hellbent for Horror podcast. He discussed one term that I'll bring to bear right now, dread. Throughout the course of watching this movie, even the week leading up to having to watch this movie, I dreaded it. I know what happens. I know it's really not horrific, as some would lead you to believe. There are tense moments, there's anxiety, but it creates a genuine sense of dread, regardless of knowing the details, regardless of knowing how it's going to happen, knowing exactly what's coming and when it still has the same effect. And I think this is the mark of a master craftsman at the height of his ability. I like to commonly say, I don't know if there's anybody that had a better four movie run than Vertigo, North by Northwest, Psycho, and The Birds in back to back to back to back movies. I don't know if anybody could ever challenge that actor director, editor, cinematographer. I mean, that is a historically good run of four movies consecutively. And one of the things that jumped out to me the most in rewatching this is how 
good a quality it is even now. I thought from the the cinematic quality, from the shot making to the sound effects, I thought the sound quality was wonderful. The editing is still magnificent. That this could have been shot yesterday and presented as a modern horror film and still be a classic. I, I agree totally. Every time I've watched it, and I've been a Hitchcock fan for most of my adult life, and I waited until much later to watch Psycho because I had been told how just absolutely intense it was. And I remember watching it, and I kind of knew what the circumstances were and how it was going to end. But even then, the twists, the turns, the, the surprises were just almost like shocking in and of themselves. And the movie just, <laughs> every time I watch it, the more I appreciate it. it it's just a, a piece of absolute brilliance as far as cinema. I, I don't know how much better someone could be at preparing, designing, and creating a movie of this genre or this ability that had such an emotional impact upon the audience. Part of the thing was is that Hitchcock himself was having trouble getting it financed because Vertigo had been kind of a flop and uh, as far as money making, he, he ended up financing this a large part by himself by mortgaging his house. And so he came up with a whole concept of no one shall be seated and or beyond the opening credits and all kinds of things to make it even more so. You do this every week and you steal the thunder before we can actually discuss it. Oh, well, sorry. You, you've got a few things, but I have a very long did you know section. I think this this film, more than almost any other Hitchcock film, has garnered such appreciation and discussion that there's too many details to not have a longer did you know section than normal. Well, I can do the plot summary and then we can do the do you did you know. Well, I had so a couple that... of more questions of setup here. Okay, well, go ahead. So one was, did you do what I asked and get somebody else to watch it with you, namely mom or Sarah? No. That's disappointing. Now, my other big question, and it's it's uh, an important one. Well, actually, I have two more. The shower scene alone has been discussed and analyzed for decades and will likely dominate our discussion of this movie. Set the context of that scene in this movie in 1960 for us. Well, it, it was, it almost got cut because no one had appeared in a half slip and bra before Janet Lee appeared in this film. Moreover, just the fact that they're, the camera is getting down and showing cleavage of her in the shower was beyond what the censors allowed. This was really risque. This was, and Janet Lee at the time was considered one of the great sexy uh, film actresses in Hollywood. She was really well uh, known and really well regarded and was considered to be a great beauty. And so the the whole shower scene was there's a certain aspect of voyeurism and of eroticism at the same time murder and violence and there's an eroticism and the sexuality that interplay and Hitchcock so interwove those that it almost highlighted each of them because they played off of each other. So there are two big things that I'd like to hit here as far as context. Number one being playing off of what you just mentioned, the history of horror films going for the next 30 years after this has a lot to do with denying sexual desire. And horror is commonly in intertwined with sexuality as something dirty and something to be reviled at times. And I think a lot of it has to do with this movie, setting the stage for the innocence and the vulnerability that you have to have during sex, as opposed to at any other time. It, it requires a certain amount of intimacy that has been the playground for horror films 
going forward after that. And you even get a sense of that in something like Jaws, where the opening scene is the girl who is going to go skinny dipping with the guy and she gets towed under and eaten, essentially. Every piece of modern horror has some element of a relationship as part of it, and a lot of them are rooted in this. But the other piece of this is, I think it was incredibly shocking to kill off your top build person 30 minutes into the movie. I Well, I guess it's probably closer to 45. Yes. We, we're much more desensitized in a modern sense. Like if, if I showed this to somebody who's 20 right now, who grew up on Game of Thrones, it wouldn't be that big a deal because we've gotten so many TV shows, movies, whatever else, where the death is not as shocking. But that by itself and being willing to take the chance of killing off somebody as notable as Janet Lee that quickly into the movie it is novel and i'm sure it's going to come up in our scores later on but is is just shocking by itself from a contextual standpoint that by far might be the biggest mark of this movie i i agree i mean we it just took a 180 degree turn and no one saw it coming i mean you you're you're following her uh situation you're following her you know, her, her actions throughout the film and you come to a point and then all of a sudden, boom, in a matter of what is it? I think it's three like minutes. two and a, three, three minutes. minutes, three minutes, the entire film changes and it's now a completely different film. So what is your relationship to this movie then? I, I think you've kind of already described it, but we go through this question every week and I think it's an important one to revisit. Yeah, it, it's clear what this was, which is a film that was one that I always wanted to see, but was apprehensive to see because it it just seemed overwhelming because I'm not a big fan or have not been a big fan of horror or, or whatever because I, I just have a problem in dealing with things that are I find overly intense, that I have a direct fear of, etc., so I never watched a lot of, you know, uh, Frankenstein and Dracula and all of those films when I was a kid. I kind of was apprehensive to watch it. Then I watched it and realized what a good film it was. And now I've watched it probably five or six times since and realize each time I watch it how much better the film is. The horror genre to me is much in the same way you've described what President Nixon was. Either you loved him or you hated him. And I think there are people that absolutely love horror. They love watching scary movies. It's one of their favorites. They love putting this stuff on and they love the intensity and the gore and the violence and every other part of it. And then there are the people like you and I that dread putting some of this stuff on because we don't like all of those pieces. We like to be intellectually engaged as opposed to sensory engaged. And this is a sensory overload in a lot of ways. My relationship to this movie is in the same way that you probably had it because you were the one that was passing down most Hitchcock movies to me. I saw Rear Window, and yes, that has a tense final scene and a struggle, but it really isn't anything terrible. I had seen Vertigo, which eh, you could say is kind of horror-esque, but it's more horror-adjacent as opposed to like a true... This is much different and much more intense. I'd seen North by Northwest, you know, other... Hitchcock films, but none of them took them to the level of this. And this was always something that was taboo until I got into college where I've kind of forced myself to finally watch it because I just grew up that I didn't want to see horror films. It was never something that we sat around or engaged in as a family. And so my relationship is I, I literally watched it for a class, I think, in college because I, I finally said, all right, you're going to have to watch it at least once. I know you're not going to necessarily like it. I've come to appreciate it differently as I've become more and more desensitized to some of these things, which may be telling in itself. But at 31, I can appreciate and watch this much differently than I did at 18 or yeah, I think I watched it at 19. But regardless, 
that my relationship to this is the relationship I have to all horror films, but this is the entrance point for that. And for that, I am somewhat appreciative. I remember the first time I had your mother watch The Birds. I don't even know if she watched half of the film. I think she spent half of the film with her eye, her hands over her eyes because she just couldn't handle some of the scenes of the birds flying and, and such. So I, I've never, I know she's watched part of this because I made her sit down and watch part. I don't know if we've ever finished it together. She is better than what she used to be, but these kinds of films just would send her into like uh, nightmares for weeks. Well, that's why I was curious if if I could get her or Sarah to watch it because they usually have such a tough time, but I think have through their mutual love of true crime kind of grown into a an area where I thought they could stomach it a lot better. But that's neither here nor there. So let's get to the plot summary. Do you have one ready for us? I do. Phoenix Secretary Marion Crane, played by Janet Lee, on the lam after stealing 40000 from her employer in order to run away with her boyfriend, Sam Loomis, John Gavin, is overcome by exhaustion during a heavy rainstorm. Traveling on the back roads to avoid the police, she stops for the night at the ramshackle Bates Motel and meets the polite but highly strung proprietor, Norman Bates, Anthony Perkins, a young man with a hobby in taxidermy who seemingly has a difficult relationship with his mother. However, there is more going on at the Bates Motel than at first glance. Thank you. Cast for this movie, Anthony Perkins as Norman Bates, Vera Miles as Lila Crane, Janet Lee as Marion Crane, John Gavin as Sam Loomis, Martin Balsam as Private Investigator Arbogast, John McIntyre as Deputy Sheriff Al Chambers, Simon Oakland as Dr. Richmond, Frank Albertson as Tom Cassidy, Pat Hitchcock as Caroline, Vaughn Taylor as George Lowry, Lorene Tuttle as Mrs. Chambers. Recognition for this movie. Psycho was nominated for four Academy Awards, including Best Supporting Actress for Janet Leigh and Best Director for Hitchcock. Psycho is now considered one of Hitchcock's best films and is arguably his most famous work. It has been praised as a major work of cinematic art by international film critics and scholars due to its slick direction, tense atmosphere, impressive camera work, a memorable score, and iconic performances. Psycho has appeared on a number of lists by websites, television channels, and magazines. The shower scene was featured as number four on the list of Bravo Network's 100 Scariest Movie Moments, whilst the finale was ranked number four on Premiere's similar list. In the British Film Institute's 2012 Sight and Sound polls of the greatest films ever made, Psycho was 35th among critics and 48th among directors. In the early 2002 version of the list, the film ranked 35th among critics and 19th among directors. In 1998, Time Out conducted a reader's poll, and Psycho was voted the 29th greatest film of all time. The Village Voice ranked Psycho at number 19 in its 250 best films of the century list in 1999, based on a poll of critics. Entertainment Weekly voted it the 11th greatest film of all time in 1999. In January 2002, the film was voted at number 72 on the list of top 100 essential films of all time by the National Society of Film Critics. The film was included in Time's all-time 100 best movies list in 2005. Also in 2005, Total Film Magazine ranked Psycho as the sixth greatest horror film of all time. In 2010, The Guardian newspaper ranked it as the best horror film of all time. Director Martin Scorsese included Psycho in his list of 11 scariest horror films of all time. In 2017, Empire Magazine's Reader's Poll ranked Psycho at number 53 on its list of the 100 greatest movies. In an earlier poll held by the same magazine in 2008, it was voted 45th on the list of the 500 greatest movies of all time. In 2021, the film was ranked at number 5 by Time Out on their list of 100 best horror movies. It was number 18 on AFI's 100 Years 100 Movies list from 1998. It was number 1 on AFI's 100 Years 100 Thrills. Norman Bates was the number 2 villain on AFI's 100 Years 100 Heroes and Villains. Quote, a boy's best friend is his mother was ranked 56th on 
AFI's 100 Years 100 movie quotes. It was number four on AFI's 100 Years of Film Scores, and it was number 14 on AFI's 100 Years 100 Movies list from 2007. In 1992, the Library of Congress selected it for preservation in the National Film Registry. Did you know? Sir Alfred Hitchcock wanted to make this movie so much that he deferred his standard $250,000 salary in lieu of 60% of the movie's gross. Paramount Pictures, believing that this movie would do so poorly at the box office, agreed. His personal earnings from this movie exceeded $15 million. Adjusted for inflation, that amount would be just over $120 million in 2016. <laughs> this movie only cost $800,000 to make and earned more than $40 million. Sir Alfred Hitchcock used the crew from his television series, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, to save time and money. In 1962, he exchanged the rights to the movie and his television series for a huge block of MCA stock, becoming its third largest shareholder. Did you know? One of the reasons Sir Alfred Hitchcock shot the movie in black and white was he thought it would be too gory in color, but the main reason was that he also wanted to make the movie as inexpensively as possible, under $1 million. He also wondered if so many bad, inexpensively made black and white B movies did so well at the box office, what would happen if a really good, inexpensively made black and white movie was made? Did you know? Screenwriter Joseph Stefano and director El Sir Alfred Hitchcock deliberately layered in certain risque elements as a ruse to divert the censors from more crucial concerns, like the action that takes place in the bedroom in the beginning and the shower murder. The censors reviewed the script and censored the unimportant extra material, and Hitchcock managed to sneak in his important material. Did you know? Sir Alfred Hitchcock was initially disappointed with the movie. He even disliked the shower scene and believed the movie would end up on a low-budget drive-in double bill. According to Bernard Herrmann, Hitchcock thought of editing it down for broadcast on his television show. Hitchcock did not conceive of music for the shower scene, but Herrmann did it anyway. After seeing the movie with its score, including the shower sequence, he realized that the movie would work. Did you know? Director Sir Alfred Hitchcock was so pleased with the score written by Bernard Herrmann that he doubled the composer's salary to $34,501. Hitchcock later said, 33% of the effect of Psycho was due to the music. Did you know? When the cast and crew began work on the first day, they had to raise their right hands and promise not to divulge one word of the story. Sir Alfred Hitchcock also withheld the ending part of the script from his cast until he needed to shoot it. Did you know? Director Sir Alfred Hitchcock bought the rights to the novel anonymously from Robert Block for only $9,000. He then bought up as many copies of the novel as he could to keep the ending a secret. Did you know? To ensure the people were in the theaters at the start of the movie, rather than walking in partway through, the studio provided a record to play in the foyer of the theaters. The album featured background music, occasionally interrupted by a voice saying, 10 minutes to Psycho Time, 5 minutes to Psycho Time, and so on. Did you know? The amount of cash Marion stole, $40,000 in 1960, would be equivalent to approximately $352,000 in 2020. The $700 difference she paid when trading in her car and getting another one would be the equivalent to $6,100. Did you know? When Norman first realizes there has been a murder, he shouts, Mother! Oh God! God! Blood! Blood! Sir Alfred Hitchcock had the bass frequencies removed from Anthony Perkins' voice to make him sound much more like a frightened teenager. Did you know? After this movie's release, Sir Alfred Hitchcock received an angry letter from the father of a girl who refused to have a bath after seeing Diabolique from 1955 and now refused to shower after seeing this movie. Hitchcock sent a note back simply saying, Send her to the dry cleaners. <laughs> Did you know? Sir Alfred Hitchcock used Bosco chocolate syrup instead of blood because it showed up better on camera. Did you know? As the victim of Norman Bates' shower attack in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, Janet Lee has said that she didn't like taking showers in real life anymore. She opted for baths after filming that movie, and she told the New York Times that she made sure all the windows and doors in the house were locked, and if she did take a shower, she left the bathroom door and curtain open. Did you know? Walt Disney refused to allow Sir Alfred Hitchcock to film at Disneyland in the early 60s because Hitchcock had made, quote, that disgusting movie, Psycho. Did you know? On set, Sir Alfred Hitchcock would always refer to Anthony Perkins as Master Bates. 
<laughs> Hitchcock did have a reputation for often harassing male and female cast members like this. See Tippy Hedren, Bill Mummy, etc. Did you know the Bates House, though moved from its original location, still resides on Universal's lot? The motel has been replicated. It is a regular stop on the Universal Studios tram tour. A couple of things that did not make the cut on my list and do not appear on the website, but this was also the first time a flushing toilet had been seen on film and was a unusually controversial topic for the censors. The act of it flushing in a movie seems kind of um, <laughs> mild by modern standards, but yeah, apparently that was a big deal at the time. And uh, I somehow missed putting this in here, but Yes, no one was allowed to enter the theater, supposedly, after the start of the program, and that helped build a sense of, you have to see this movie that contributed to its overall box office, I guess. So, with that, uh, I might have missed a few things in there. I know there's plenty of facts and background to go on this for literally ever. I read about (laughs) a novel today just trying to prepare for this, but... Let's go to elevator pitches. What is yours? I had such a difficult time trying to boil this down. The average person mixed up with a serial killer. Okay. Yeah, this is not an easy one to summarize, so I kind of cheated a little bit. I went with much more of the psychological as opposed to doing anything with the film. For growing boys, their relationship to their mother defines their adult sexuality. What's that say about you? I knew you were going to go there. I knew you were going to go there. Well, of course. If you're going to lob it. Anyway, I know she doesn't listen to the show, so let's just move on. (laughs) Yes. Uh, uh, Best performance for you? Hitchcock. It's... it's (laughs) The, The camera angles, even when there are panning shots and zoom shots, he has this ability to pick an angle for the shot that's just like it 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 brings suspense just by the camera zooming in or zooming out i i the more i watched it and i was looking at it critically i just can't believe that i mean this is like a a a class on how to use a camera to do or to build a motion it's just phenomenal so I have no choice but to give it to him. I love Anthony Perkins in this because Tony Perkins just was so good at being both innocent and diabolical at the same time. You knew there was something wrong here, but he just kind of came about as so lucky. So I wanted to, but I'm like, Hitchcock just did so much. Yeah, we'll get to Tony Perkins or Anthony Perkins here in a minute. I, I definitely want to hit that before we get too very far. A couple of things that stuck out to me. So one, I I literally paused it multiple times. And I think, yes, the camera work was incredible at times. I I thought the way that they were able to stage shots was incredibly inventive for the time, such as in my research today. And I, I didn't put this in the did you know section, but the only way they were able to do the shower head scene where you got the camera staring straight into the shower head was quite literally, they plugged the inside holes. It was only the outside ring. And then they set up a cone around the camera lens that made the water shoot past the camera lens. So it was literally going down, but it wasn't going to get the camera wet. Like, how do you even think of something like that or conceptualize doing that in order to make this movie? It's an incredibly creative and novel aspect that I don't think anybody had considered up to this point. Some of the editing for the shot sequences of this movie, I want to take your attention to one specific thing. When Lila is approaching the house, Vera Miles' character, for the first time, and they keep, she's just slowly crawling up the hill, and it's like a zoom-in shot that it's filmed like from eye level as you would be approaching the house, but then keeps cutting back and forth, and they keep shortening the sequences. I thought that was a great job of editing because... How many times have we not seen that in other modern horror films cut to what she's looking at and approaching something that's off off limits, essentially, like the door that you're not supposed to go behind or whatever, and then cutting back to the character as they keep slowly approaching the thing they're not supposed to go to. 
I thought that was great staging. And yet, for me, it was 1A, 1B. I had a hard time deciding between these. I'll give my best performance and my best secondary performance, neither of which to Alfred Hitchcock. In this particular case, I went best performance to Bernard Herrmann. And it's for one particular reason. Bernard Herrmann had two professional disagreements with Hitchcock over the course of his career. One was to score the shower sequence and all of the stuff inside the Bates Motel that I think makes this movie. And I think even Hitchcock reluctantly gave credit to him for essentially making the ambiance of this movie. What would the shower sequence be without that just absolutely screeching string section as the knife is plunging into Janet Lee. And the fact, or the other professional disagreement was the one where they basically broke up from Torn Curtain. I'm not sure what that one exactly was, but essentially ruined their professional re- relationship at that point. Anyway, the point being that he did not listen to Hitchcock, knew better, made the film better, and t- for my money, actually made the film. The score from everything from the opening credits up through the ending is defined by the musical intensity at every juncture. Well, I understand your point. That's why I gave Bernard Herrmann set best secondary performance. But I, I read an article, uh, The Body Double, for Janet Lee did most of the actual camera work. Janet Lee was actually in the shower for a few hours. So that's a highly contentious fact because she maintains and whoever was the camera operator also maintains that she did all of the work in the shower itself and that, you know, this has gone back and forth whether they were using cold or warm water. So this is, there are a lot of details that are debated. The one she says and has been on the record as saying was the body double was used when Anthony Perkins is basically rolling up the body in the shower curtain and putting it in the trunk. That was a body double, but all the shower work was herself. So I'm just putting that out there. I I don't know what, but I've read different accounts. So anyway, continue. Yeah, it's the same principle of, because we're living in Wisconsin, if everybody who claimed to be at the Ice Bowl in 1967 was there, Lambeau Field would have hold about 400,000 people. You know, it's the same principle. Everybody wants in and saying they were more involved than they were based on the success of something. Either way, whether you talk about Janet Lee's comments or you talk about the body's co- or the body doubles comments, Hitchcock, because he was a storyboard director early in his career, had visualization of every shot. So when he said cut, and he would set the cameras, and he would know exactly every camera angle, every shot he wanted for the next sequence. And he knew exactly visually what he was looking for, and he could see it in his head what the film would ultimately look be or would look like with the editing. So again, that's why I'm going with Hitchcock, because visually he made the film. And as far as that goes, the secondary performance, I agree with everything you said. I agree that uh, Bernard Herrmann should have gotten it because the the violins uh, screeching, that, that piece of, well, if you want to even call it music, so set the tone and this tempo, it made the shower scene even more intense and uh, memorable. Well, it goes at such highs and lows, but I I will mention one thing that I I feel a little bit obligated. Again, another one of these, it's a discrepancy between things, but supposedly there are books that maintain that Hitchcock himself did not shoot the shower sequence, that it was actually the visual arts director, um, whose name I think was Bass, but from the people that were there and maintained that they were part of it, They said he was there for every shot. So I'm just mentioning it again because it's debated. But given the amount of, like I said, academic work and discussion on this particular scene from this particular movie, and it may be one of the most iconic scenes in cinema history, I I do want to at least put the the countervailing narratives. For me, though, it's best secondary, and this is where I went, 1B is Anthony Perkins. 
And I'll just simply draw it to that final moment that you get on screen of him. Say what you want about the weird Dr. Richmond explanation at the end of the movie that people really disagree with. Personally, the first couple of times I watched it, I'm like, all right, I kind of like that they explained it a little bit. Maybe this goes on a little bit too long and they're really playing around with things and they could have gotten to the point more. But that last moment where he's sitting by himself, just staring, spiking the camera, and we listen to the mother's voice and he has that just devilish smile and you see it in the eyes the the sadistic almost he's not completely there I didn't think he had anybody to necessarily compare himself to or that he could draw upon from other movies with a modern culture and the foundation around horror genre to this point or in the modern day you have plenty of examples of how to play different types of serial killers or people that are deranged or people that are mentally unstable and you could do it successfully. I think he created somewhat of an archetype that unfortunately made him a typecast, but he said he never regretted being typecast because of the iconic nature of this role. He is evil incarnate in that moment. And it's there's a reason that that picture is shown over and over and over and over in a way that you can't describe. It's just the visual. Well, and, and, and to some extent that's Hitchcock's whole point, because what is it like at the very end of that sequence, he uh, superimposes a skull over Perkins's face showing that he is deaf. Yeah. I, I, it is masterful in a lot of different areas. I think I could have gone in a lot of different ways with how well this was done. So I'm glad we hit the ones we did. There are plenty of other people you could recognize that I thought had great performances in this as well. Martin Balsam batting really, really well in this movie for a bit part that he did. You want to talk about the the screenwriting was exceptional for what changes they made in adapting the book because the book's incredibly different from this in how they set up and stage certain portions of of what's going on. I thought Vera Miles was wonderful in this movie. So you could go in a number of different directions. I ultimately also said most charismatic for Anthony Perkins because you're drawn to him every time he's on, on camera. Because he is somebody that you feel sympathy toward when he's presented as Norman Bates. He is the abused boy through the course of the film. Obviously, if you've seen this film a few times, you know the ending, and so it doesn't take on the same reticence. But he has this innocence and this eagerness and almost playfulness that's childlike, and yet you can see some of the darkness. I know we compared it to Joseph Cotton last week and how to kind of flip the switch between being charismatic and then being that just incredibly dark person. And I think that Perkins did a very great job. You can just see small flickers of it here and there that kind of should give you an inkling, but it's still surprising at the ending because you think that there is two separate characters. Well, I agree with you as part of that. uh, And I had... A tie. I had uh, most charismatic for Perkins and for Janet Lee, primarily because I just wanted to mention Janet Lee's performance. But Perkins and and one of the scenes that I'm going to talk about when we get to that point is the scene between Norman and uh, uh, well, it was Tony Perkins and and John Gavin towards the end of the film where Gavin's basically trying to steer him into an admission that he, uh, you know, did something in order to get access to the money. And you can see Norman feeling very uncomfortable and you can see his reaction that he's, that this is psychologically taxing on him, that he's realizing that he's close to being caught and that there's a, a tension building within him that is just so palpable uh, if you watch it for that purpose, not just for the action of what's being said or what's being done, but watch his reaction to the lines being given 
I thought it was masterful work on his part. And Janet Lee, I, I don't know what more to say other than even though she was a thief and whatever, she was able to get you to be an empathetic and sympathetic to her. And you really felt some level of pain when she's murdered. Certainly. I, I can definitely feel all of that. I will say, and this is another surprising piece that I forgot to mention. So I was trying to look at best quotes, and I, I know we're going to get to that later, but one of the ones that kept coming up was, I'm Norma Bates. And I said, I don't remember that ever being in the film. It took me a while in the research, apparently. And you can't unhear it once you actually like hear it. But in the reveal moment where we see the, the mother finally revealed, there is supposedly integrated into the score a voiceover of someone saying, I'm Norma Bates. It's very subtle. Huh. So I, I'll have to pick that out the next time because I still don't remember that being in that sequence. Yeah. But anyway, so then let's move on to best scene then. And uh, I mean, this, this has got a lot of different scenes that I was going to highlight. Uh, opening in the hotel car dealership, dinner with Norman, shower scene, Sam, Lila, and Arbogast meet up, Arbogast meets Norman, Arbogast climbs the stairs, seeing the sheriff, Lila goes up to the house, meeting mother, and then the final moments. Did I miss any? Uh, the cop, where she starts to really feel guilt and regret. And then it exemplifies and almost builds into the same piece, which is the car, used car lot. Yeah, I, I thought that by doing the car dealership, I could kind of wrap that into one thing. Because technically they're separate, but I don't know. It, it, it's a tough te scene to put a label on. Yeah, and then the other part is, is the scene with Gavin and Perkins, where he's basically accusing him of taking the money to try to get out of the hotel. I don't know if you consider that part of the scene with Lila or not. I do. But... I do. Because I, it's the back and forth. Because ultimately, you know that if he gets wind that she's going up to the house in order to catch him, or excuse me, that he could go back to catch her, that that's the intensity of that whole sequence and what is going to happen when she finds the mother finally. Yes. So I, I think that's all built into one tension of the, uh, that whole reveal sequence. The one that I would say that uh, I'll highlight, though, from that list, and I don't think we're going to talk about it either way otherwise, when Arbogast meets Norman and he starts asking him all of those questions, I just felt like you were grilling Sarah. <laughs> That reminded me so much of, oh, well, I mean, I guess I remember her. Um, can I see your logbook? Oh, sure. I mean, and just kind of stringing him along. Oh, well, this is a hole in your story. Do you want to change it now? Yes. The uh, risks of having a father who used to be a criminal attorney and has a vast experience in cross-examination. Yeah, it, it was uh, an unusual scene that I, I just liked because of the the uh, implication it gave me. But anyway. Yeah, it's the story of the sandwich in the van. I wasn't going to go there, since most people aren't going to have the context for that one, and we don't have time. But Yeah, I know. Any of the other scenes, or any of the scenes on here you'd like to highlight before we get to best scene? No, I, I think I've covered everything I wanted to. Okay. Then let's go, what do you think out of these is the best scene then? Well, I mean, obviously the shower scene, and that's also my most indelible moment, but I would give a secondary one to the scene I keep talking about, which is I was just absolutely fascinated by the entire sequence between Gavin and Perkins and Vera Miles going into the house. And that whole s sequence was just so well done in the back and forth. And you could feel the interplay between the, diff or the two different 
people and the characters and what's going on. And then the, Gavin is struck in the head and then all of a sudden the, it's just a phenomenal scene. I'll highlight one that I, I think should be at least in the consideration, even though it's not as masterfully shot. I think the editing was well done, it, but you, you can kind of see some of the limitations of where they were at. And yet it's still actually a fairly well done scene, despite some of the visuals that are behind it. And that's Arbogast going up the stairs. I still think that that's probably one of the better moments in the movie. And it does come up a lot on people's impressions of this movie. I think it's revisited a lot despite, you know, yeah, the shower scene gets all the, the attention, but you still get that same amount of dread from that sequence. And then going to the overhead camera like that so that you somehow don't show the mother's face, I, I thought was a brilliant stroke. So best scene though, are, are we going to really quibble on it? I, it's no, by default, it's going to be the shower scene. Favorite scene for me is Arbogast climbing the stairs. What was your favorite? Just the sequence with uh, Gavin and Perkins and Miles, as I indicated. And most indelible moment, uh, is this a default one as well? Of course. It's the scene that's most portrayed over and over. Yeah, it's been most borrowed, most referenced to. It's the thing that's been picked apart for years and years and years. I don't think there's really any question as to indelibility when it comes to that that scene. It's the first thing that everybody thinks about, and unfortunately, it's kind of ruined the surprise of the movie for a lot of people, but even so, I, I think this is by far the most indelible. So uh, the, we are at our natural stopping point at the moment. Let's take a quick break, and we will be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for rejoining us. All right, Dad, before we get into best funniest lines, which there are no funniest lines in this one, do we have anyone to remember this week? Uh, yes, uh, Betty Lynn. Uh, she was 95 when she passed. Best known for being Thelma Lou, Barney's girlfriend on The Andy Griffith Show. Uh, she also appeared in a few films. What most notable was uh, a part in the original Cheaper by the Dozen. I don't have any familiarity with her, but uh, I'm sure that uh, she was a, a certain piece of Americana if she was on the Andy Griffith show. A uh, brief moment of silence just to remember her work. Thank you. All right, let's get to best lines then. I only have a few of them down. This isn't a terribly quotable movie, but there are a few here and there. What do you have down as your first one? Mother. Oh, God. Mother. Blood. Blood. Yeah, that's my first one as well. My second one, Norman. It's not like my mother is a maniac or a raving thing. She just goes a little mad sometimes. We all go a little mad sometimes, haven't you? Marion. Yes. Sometimes just one time can be enough. Norman. A boy's best friend is his mother. Norman. I think I... Must have one of those faces you just can't help believing. Norman. Mother. What's the phrase? She isn't quite herself today? Arbogast. We're always quickest to doubt people who have a reputation for being honest. Uh, mine's from the final moment of the film. Voice over in police custody as Norman is thinking. They're probably watching me. Well, let them. Let them see what kind of person I am. I'm not even going to swat that fly. I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know. And they'll say, why, she wouldn't even harm a fly. By the way, as an aside, did you notice the cameo in that scene? No. Oh, well, yeah, you've pointed it out to me before. Yes. that it was the guard Judge at the Schmail. door. Yes. Ted Knight. Ted Knight. Do you have any others? No. Nope. All right, then let's get right to the rubric. Legacy up. You, I'll let you lead off. You were more enthusiastic about uh, leading off today. so I think this movie has impacted American cinema. I don't think you have the films that we have today. I don't think you have Halloween. I don't think you have Friday the 13th. I don't think you have any of these without this film. 
I think this film has had uh, the iconic moment of the shower scene. I think that uh, this uh, cemented Hitchcock's place in the pantheon of great film directors. I think that this is studied, it is massaged, it is redone, it is considered when other directors do films for its camera work. I, I This is one where I have to give it as a legacy, a straight 10, I think, for the uh, public. it's You mentioned shower scene. Everyone will know immediately what you're talking about. And, in, and uh, among the industry, it is a benchmark for filmmaking. So both would be five. I agree on all of those points, and yet, so I'm going to split the category as we normally do. I think in the re-examination of this, and this is going to come up in, in the next category, at the time, critics were not as positive on this film. They didn't understand it. This was a movie well ahead of its time as far as the industry was concerned. But on their re-examination, in all the subsequent history, academia, discussion, etc., the industry has really come around to the point of celebrating this movie. I think it's now been knocked down a little bit in comparison to like Vertigo has gone above this movie on certain lists as the the seminal Hitchcock work. I think there's a debate whether Rear Window, Vertigo, uh, North by Northwest, The Birds, Psycho could be his best film. I think all five of those are probably the the only ones that could lay claim to that. That being said, this is recognized as being significant to the horror genre. I agree with you wholeheartedly that it basically sets up all of modern horror making and the, the genre to itself. I don't think it's completely or that it completely sets every foundation of that. There are some international films that you can point to, but from an American horror standpoint, going into the 70s where we really open things up, you start to get The Omen and Rosemary's Baby, uh, the Halloween movies, etc. They all draw upon this model. And so I agree from that standpoint. So I have to give it a full five from the industry because of the appreciation and the foundation that it laid, the academia that it's drawn, etc. However, I think from an audience standpoint, I also agree with you that it's iconic from the shower scene. If we were just simply talking about the shower scene, I'd give it a full five for the audience. But I don't know how many people have actually honestly seen this movie. I think it lives in the consciousness. It's referenced. I think they know the shower scene. But is it really as seen, beloved, notable as something like when we gave a full 10 to The Wizard of Oz? I'm not sure it is. So I give it a slight peg down some of the other movies we've given straight 10s in this category. I'll go with a 4.5 for the audience giving it a nine and a half. It ends up as a seven point, or excuse me, a 9.75 between us as the app. Okay. I understand your point, but again, if you come up to, or go up to a hundred people and say Norman Bates, I think uh, 90 of those at least are going to go, Oh, from psycho. I think you're wrong. I think it's 50, 50. I think you'd have to give them context. Okay. I, I don't think it's nearly as iconic as, as we film nerds think, but it is, again, I think it's also an age thing. If we go up to 100 people from your generation, that may be the case. But if you go up to 50 people that are under 30, and that's what we're dealing with. Unfortunately, the longer we get away from it, the less people seem to know it. And it's not like it's a cable movie that can easily be displayed because of its somewhat graphic nature. Although now that I say that, I'm sure this has been played by TMC or TCM, excuse me, multiple times because we've gotten so far away from it that like it's really easily able to be shown on TV at this point. So impact significance, would you like to go first or second? Go ahead. So this one I found to be a much more interesting case. Again, this is a category that we define within the first three years or excuse me, five years after its release. The fact that the studio and at times Hitchcock himself thought that this was going to be a failure, that this was not a highly touted movie, that he kind of did this with a lot of his television creativeness in mind, 
is a little bit telling of what the industry thought of these types of films. The horror genre had yet to become a thing, and it's sort of created, at least the American version, by this movie. So it's not like they have a whole lot to draw upon. I think from an industry standpoint, it was way ahead of its time for the critics and for industry people. Critical reviews were mixed, and that's being somewhat generous, But some people were so viscerally offended that I did read one woman actually left the screening as a critic and quit her job as a critic in response. She was just so off put by this movie. But all of this is set against the context. This was the number two grossing movie of that year. It had a huge surge of goodwill. There were lines upon lines of people trying to get in to see this movie. It had such a word of mouth and the the public reception of this movie so contradicted what the critics and general industry people thought of this movie that it forced a re-examination. So from an industry standpoint, I'm going to go with a 3, or excuse me, I'll go with a 2.5, and I'll go with the full 5 for the audience because they had to drag along the industry into re-examining this movie. So that ends as a 7.5 for me. We're not that far off. Uh, I had three for the industry for for much of the same reasons you pointed. And having lived through the era, a film that was a very similar circumstance because critics thought it was just stupid, didn't understand, was Airplane. When Airplane came out, the critics all did pan it. This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. It's not funny. There's nothing about it that's entertaining. And then the audience is just piled in and it made a shitload of money and then the uh, uh, critics all said well i really did like it and it was really creative and it's like recreating history and i think that's to some extent what's happened here i don't think the the critics really appreciated it i think they got caught up in the visceral aspect of the violence and the in the circumstances, instead of looking at it as the cinematic marvel that it is, so they missed it. So I went with five for the public and three for the industry. So you went with your eight. Okay. So then it's a 7.75 average between us. And again, I'll just make the general comment that realistically, between the two of us, one of the reasons we keep doing the show, and I know we've mentioned it a bunch of times, but we'll beat a dead horse on this point. A lot of times the industry and critics miss the boat on horror, on comedy, on romantic uh, films. They're interested in serious dramas most of the time. And so it ends up making them myopic. And part of the reason of doing this is to give better understanding or better appreciation to movies that maybe not or are maybe not considered among the greatest by the industry but should be considered among the general audience. True. And and as somebody who's often accused of taking himself too seriously, that's what movie critics do. So I think you're going to go a little bit higher than me on novelty. So I'm going to give mine first and let you maybe try and bring me up because I think I can be persuaded up, but not very far. I would argue that it is the birthplace of American modern horror film. And I already made that point. I only knock it down slightly as this was done partly in response to apparently Hitchcock's complex that he was being negatively compared to a French director named Clouseau for his work in Diabolique that we mentioned before from 1955 was a French movie. And that it didn't exactly create the psycho horror killer. I mean, we'd had it in other instances, but they were almost all international films. One of the ones that has been highlighted as early serial killer movie uh, was uh, M from Fritz Long, and I think that's 1931, a German director that's a little bit more famous in film circles, but not necessarily for American audiences. So I gave it a slight knockdown, but from the camera work to the editing to the music and the amount of things that created the foundation for an entire industry of movies that still has effects in modern movie making, I give this a 9.5. Well, okay. I uh, have (laughs) 9.5. 
And the only reason I didn't give it a 10 was because to some extent the whole aspect of murder and changing of the way that the script had so many twists and turns had been done before. So it wasn't completely novel, but it was as darn close as you could get. I mean, no film that I've ever seen uh, before this ever took a complete turn and really became two separate films halfway through. I guess the only argument I could say for bumping it up, and I, I could be persuaded to attend, the only two movies we've given full tens on novelty are Some Like It Hot and 12 Angry Men. Yeah. And there, there's an easy argument to be made that this is more novel than either of those. And based on that, I will give it a full 10. I think I have to. I Again, I, I don't often do it, but I think sometimes we owe it to ourselves from a creativity standpoint. So let's just revisit some of these. 9.83 for Alien, 9.75 for The Artist, thanks Sarah, 9.58 for Jaws. Those are the top five for novelty. And then we have a bunch of 9.5s. But I, I think from where this was at, for the context that it was in time, the amount of chances that it takes that maybe we don't appreciate now, I, I think I have to give it a 10. I was trying to be more critically leaning, but I think in order to be fair comparatively, if those other films are going to be a 10, and yes, we give credence. I think Some Like It Hot is probably one of the most novel films that I can think of from a comedy for essentially cross-dressing and making it funny, but this has got to be in that category as well. I, I don't think 12 Angry Men is nearly as novel as this and probably would knock that score down. So in order to be fair, I personally, I think we should go to a full 10. In actuality, now that I'm thinking about it in retrospect, Something Like It Hot shouldn't be a 10 because Milton Berle cross-dressed probably five to seven years before Some Like It Hot was released, and he did it on his TV show. Okay, that's that's one small thing. Like we've Oh, no, it was fairly... I mean, it was the number one TV show. Well, anyway, I would disagree, but it doesn't matter at this point. It's kind of locked in until unless we do a revisit, since that, I think, was our sixth episode. Classicness, I'll let you go first. I could not find anything that was really troublesome, per se. And the only reason I marked it down a bit was more or less the pop psychology aspect of it. It, it seemed like, you know, in retrospect, what we know about serial killers and the psychological aspect now is much more involved, intense, we have much greater much greater knowledge now of what is behind the uh, psychological aspect of these serial killers. So to some extent, I understand it had to be more or less dumbed down to an audience that had never had to experience this before. So that is a studio-included scene. They forced that into the movie. I'll just say that much. Okay. So, so that's why I went with a nine on that. All right. I always start at a seven and work my way up. I agree with you. There's nothing in here that's beyond the pale, that's problematic, that um, takes into account because even the instances of over-sexualized nature, that's how most modern horror films are made because you're trying to make a commentary on sexuality with a lot of horror. That that's necessary to what most of these are actually trying to do from almost a thematic standpoint. So even that I can't dismiss. This also took a lot of chances. It went there. This makes it seem, I mean, we talked about it at the top. I thought this movie could have been made yesterday. The quality of it is just so good. It holds up. Some of the other Hitchcock films, I think this is actually more well-made and looks better than even something like North by Northwest that cost probably five times more to make and shoot than this movie. I love North by Northwest, but that is not as good a looking movie as this is, and this is in black and white. I mean, you could make arguments that it is comparable to what we saw from, like, Mank last year. 
in the visuals. I mean, I, I think it's ridiculously that good. I thought the sound quality still holds up. The score, the the camera angles that were well ahead of their time that have been copied and recopied multiple times over. I think from every standpoint of this, I'm going with a 10. Okay. I think this is the classic of all classic horror films. All right, so that'll be a 9.5 between us. Do you need have help with the math? No, you made it pretty easy on me. Uh, rewatchability. So I'll be honest, I kind of dreaded having to watch this. I mentioned that before. It's not as bad or as scary as my anticipation goes, but there's still that dread. And I, I think it just does have to factor into my score. I'm not going to go out of my way to watch films like this, but it is such an important and classic film that I should be willing to watch it more often. And as such, I'll make a comp- compromise with myself and go with a four. All right. Comfort food. This is not something that I'm going to go to on a given night where I'm not having a good day and I want to just kind of relax and unwind and whatever. But the more I watch it, the more I realize I almost need to rewatch it once every 18 to 24 months just because having this in my mind is a comparison point to other films that I watch that are recently released. It helps because I think it is a benchmark in so many categories in so many ways. So I went with a seven. So that is a 5.5 average between us. So uh, with the audience score, we had an 88% for Google users. We had a 95% for Rotten Tomato users. To recap, we had 9.75 as the average for Legacy. We had a 7.75 as the average for Impact Significance a 10 for novelty, 9.5 for classicness, 5.5 for rewatchability, a 9.15 for audience score, making 51.65, and that currently places it in between Three Idiots and Apollo 13 on the list. Not two films that I would have compared (laughs) against this one at any point. No. Remaining questions, then. Did they get the $40,000? Yeah, that was one of my number ones as well. And basically what happens to Norman. I know that's probably answered in the subsequent sequels that happened after Hitchcock's death in like 1980, but I I don't know if I really want to bother to go watch those. No. So this is a little bit longer episode than we've been doing lately. I think it merited longer discussion, but any final thoughts on uh, Hitchcock month, Psycho, or all of the above? Well, as we're doing this, I'm I'm regaining appreciation on multiple directors. I I would have a difficult time at this point to come up with the four <laughs> faces on the directorial Mount Rushmore. It's very subjective. Oh yeah, but it I just is. absolutely love Hitchcock. You know, from a little boy on. You know, when well, I guess how the question is how little. By the time I was uh, 10, 11, the uh, cartoons that I grew up with when I was younger were no longer on. So I watched public TV on Saturday mornings, and they would have black and white TV. So it was Jack Benny, Burns and Allen, and they would have the Alfred Hitchcock Presents shows, as well as uh, Twilight Zone and some of the others. So I, I, from a very young age, watched the... Alfred Hitchcock presents television shows and was just utterly fascinated by Hitchcock and and thought his uh, work was so good. Hitchcock to me is probably a one of the great directors of all time who was never appreciated within his life really for what he was and what he accomplished. And I think so much or so many times true art True, uh, true genius uh, is lost upon the persons within their someone's own generation. Yeah, I I could definitely say that there are several directors that come to mind of that same uh, ilk, but I I do find that I have come to have different appreciation about different movies, different directors, and it'll be interesting to see as we kind of start to hit or check off some of the bigger movies off of the list this is being another one that we've 
we did a lot of setup to try and get to this point and do this movie that once we check off some of the biggest names that still have yet to come and we're trying to slow play this to give it a, a lot of runway, but as we slowly get a more rounded, get the ones off of the list or at least check the ones that everybody assumes will be near the top of the list, where everything will stack up. I, again, we said it last week and now this week and many other weeks before this, who would have thought that Psycho would be compared to an Indian Bollywood movie and a movie with Tom Hanks and Ron Howard from the mid nineties. Like it's not something that you would necessarily say is comparable. And yet we do that almost on a weekly basis. And I think it's one of the small goodies that we deliver to ourselves. I know we don't, we do this show for us first as a pursuit, but maybe somebody else will be fascinated by that. I'm just curious to see where it goes. I am too. And I, again, one of the aspects of this film is, is if you're sitting at home and it's a Friday or Saturday night when you're sitting with your significant other and you go, what do you want to watch? And he or she says, I don't know. Look at the list. I think we're giving you options of things that you could watch that you've never seen before and have an appreciation for. Films didn't start in uh, 2010. They started well before that. And uh, sometimes there's some real gems that you didn't realize existed. Well, this is my life. It always will be. There's nothing else, just us and the microphones and those wonderful people out there in the dark. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Next week, we are welcoming a new guest to the show to discuss what might be the ultimate cable movie of all time, The Shawshank Redemption, starring Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman. You won't want to miss that one, so please watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Please like, follow, rate, and review, or whatever on whichever platform you have so that you can join in on our fun. You can also email the show at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com. Find us on Instagram or on Twitter at Gmote Podcast. G-M-O-A-T Podcast. The Greatest Movie of All Time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Our technical provider and distributor is Captivate FM.